you can now hear Movie Heaven Movie Hell on Stitcher. Stitcher is ready on demand. Listen anytime, anywhere. Stitcher is an award-winning free app that lets you listen to all your favorite shows, plus discover from 20,000 news, entertainment, and sports shows. You can also create your own custom playlists. Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad, and in over 4 million car dashboards. It's on demand and it's on the go. No downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. You can stream your favorite podcasts from Stitcher. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at stitcher.com or in the App Store. And please leave us a review and rating on Stitcher. Thank you. Last week, um, I went for a job interview at uh, Elstree Studios. Uh, don't worry, it wasn't for a film job. It was uh, for an editor's job. It was just a company that was based at Elstree Studios. But uh, 16 years before that, I had worked in the area. I'd worked in Bottom Wood uh, in, the, in what was then called the uh, Cinema Bottom Wood, which is now called uh, Real Cinema. Okay. Yes. And uh, so it got me thinking... What with us talking about Tarantino and um, his sort of education from uh, the video store, I wanted to sort of talk about a my time working in the cinema, and also my you know our experiences of um, either going to video shops or you know or working around video shops. Okay, yeah, that's something I can relate to definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, uh, you, you know, as, as we've said in, in previous uh, memoir podcasts, as I call them now, um, y- y- you know, from a very young age, I've been sort of interested in film and filmmaking and certainly watching films. And yeah, when I was very young, uh, in fact, I think I was still at school when I first started and it was kind of a Saturday job that, that expanded out. Uh, I did in work. I did indeed work for a uh, a local video library. Um, It was one that, uh, you know, used to get films from originally and then ended up, you know, getting to know them there and uh, ended up with a, with, as I said, a Saturday job that then led into an evening job and so on. And that was originally, it was called Flix video. And then when, when I joined, it was Ritz video. And then while I was there, it then got bought out and changed to the good old blockbuster video, which um, which nobody yeah. knows of anymore, <laughs> <laughs> unless you watch The Simpsons or, or Family Guy or whatever. <laughs> well, the video shop I remember the most, it wasn't the first one, but I remember the most, was a, um, a video shop in Collindale called Oscar Videos. And, they, and um, yeah, it was sort of... It was called something else beforehand, and it got bought out, and um, they changed the name. But uh, yeah, I remember it was run by this um, this sort of young Indian lad. Well, I say young; he was in his twenties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I used to hang out down there all the time. I used to go down there and, and rent stuff, and he would always rent me, um, you know, eighteens and stuff um, when I was underage. Right, right. I guess again, the guy. Oh dear, now, yeah, but... go on, name and shame. Yeah. No, just... <laughs> well, I can't remember his name. Um, that's the, that's the sad thing. I can't remember what the guy. Was I called, think we but, all uh... used to watch home video stuff. Yeah, before yeah, we were I mean, he to. would. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, fun. it wasn't a case. It wasn't a case of my parents renting the films. I would go down and I would rent the films. Right. I'd always. It was the thing. Um, I don't know about you, but I always get asked by my parents to go down there and rent the films and sometimes they'd sort of tell me which ones to get or or which one or sometimes I picked and um yeah I remember sort of um either I would walk down there or I would cycle it was always about it was about 15 minutes away yeah I used to spend so much time down there and I even did the odd job from as well I remember one day I was handing out um um leaflets I was delivering them door to door right and um I remember that when I got back from that job, um, 
um, the the money I got from it, I bought uh, a copy of Batman Returns. Yay! Oh, there you go. Yeah. I mean, it is funny how things have changed, isn't it? You you think about yeah. it nowadays, and uh, you know the concept of a a library for for renting videos from is just you, you know bizarre i guess to uh to anyone you know who's 15 or whatever now and here's this they probably think what the hell <laughs> what? well let's be clear we're, we're we're talking about uh video stores yes. uh because libraries actually did rent out videos yes. i know my local library you could rent videos from but they always used to be very sort of art house films or if they were like um you know, a sort of blockbuster film that they usually weren't there. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I will say is, particularly when they um, when they became blockbuster, um, as the name would suggest, um, you, you in terms of variety, you know, in terms of like European cinema or old classics or or whatever, that that used to suddenly fade out into the background, and it used to be, you know. 45 copies of the latest film that's come out you know that that, that people would rent um rather than having but that, that was choice. the whole point of blockbuster yes. that was what made them so popular was the fact that you could go down to the video shop and you could rent the latest and film be guaranteed to get it to yeah. get it. yeah because i remember that was the one thing about um my video store was because they had only so many copies of a film that you had to be very lucky to get that copy of the film. You just had to be, you just happened to be there as somebody returned. Mm-hmm. It. I mean, I know that happened to me a lot. I mean, I'd be looking for films and I'm not finding anything that appealing. And then somebody walk in with a copy of whatever, whatever the latest film was. And you were like, Oh, I have that. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. <laughs> I mean, you know, it became more commercial. I mean, obviously when we talk about Tarantino, when he worked at video archives or whatever, I think that was one of those, and they've still got a few of them out there, you know, really mm. specialist uh, video stores that sort of stock uh, all sorts of, you know, obscure stuff and, and, and a r- wide variety. And, and I certainly remember when, uh, when I was a kid and, and we used to go rent, from the place when it was back when it was flicks video or whatever at the time and i used to go with my dad and uh you, you know there used to be a, a fair variety of, of 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 stuff and some really you know obscure stuff obviously a lot of b-movie schlock which went sort of straight to video in, mm. in that era um but but you know it was good because you got to you know watch sort of all sorts of stuff that uh, wouldn't necessarily have seen otherwise and um as i said when i when i actually started working at the store by that point it had become you know a lot more commercial and a lot more about the 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 the, the latest blockbuster um being available and 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 like you said having enough copies for people not to be disappointed (laughs) when they when they showed up but what it also meant is you only had so much wall space so often you, you, you know the suddenly the uh the uh european section got much smaller and the you know art house section maybe got a bit smaller and <laughs> and, and the and the you know b movie ho- horrors yeah. and stuff got smaller yeah. so so you know you know it, it was a double edged sword it was it was kind of a good thing and a bad thing i guess from that perspective you know <laughs> yeah i mean this is i mean I mean, Blockbuster as well killed off a lot of um, smaller video chains. Mm-hmm. A lot of the the video the smaller video stores when they had a Blockbuster move in, that was it. They sort of they died a death because everybody f- ran off to the off to Blockbuster. So when the same thing happened to Blockbuster, I didn't shed any tears. No, exactly. I mean, when when I got the as I said, when I got the job, it was before that. It was when it was a company called Ritz Video at the time, and. Um, Sounds like a cracker, doesn't it? Um, but uh, no, uh, you know, at the time I, I, I got, as I said, I was pretty young and I got the job uh, to earn some, you know, additional pocket money, to some additional living money. And um, I, I got the job largely because, you, you know, I, I showed even then a reasonable, reasonable knowledge and certainly a, a passionate interest in film. And, you, you, you know, then I ended up getting a proper job and, and but stayed working sort of evenings uh, in the video store. And this was then the beginning of the grand plan 
to go to film school and you, you know so in very in some ways it was very much the genesis of, of kicking that whole thing off for me which uh, obviously took me you know several years to uh, to achieve and, and get there but um but but yeah I, working in the video library was nice it had some perks in the fact that you know you you could you could see movies without actually having to pay to rent them and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. As well as being paid to be there. So it was quite good from that perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that was one of the perks of working in the cinema was that uh, we got to see films a lot for free. Um, so how I ended up in the cinema was um, I had been working in the industry up to this point for about a year and a half and uh for the majority of that time i had been unemployed mm -hmm. and because i was under 25 you could be unemployed for six months and then they started sending you on training schemes and they started sort of taking a, a more of a keen interest in what you were doing than for those first six months you know you come in ask have you looked for you some jobs yes i have uh did you get any no i didn't and then they go, here's your double check, off you go, <laughs> you know. And then six months, it was like, uh, and then I, I didn't really want that scrutiny because I was working I, and I wasn't getting paid, but I was working. Mm -hmm. And I never, I never told them about any of this. I mean, a lot of us were back then when we were working on these low budget shoots, there's always somebody had to go off to sign on. I'm just worried that the IRS is suddenly going to contact you with a mask and bill, Simon. <laughs> Let them, I mean, we're talking, you know, 17 years uh, ago. But I didn't get paid. That was oh, the thing. Right, right. I, I, I only got covered my expenses. Fair enough. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. You know, I, I, I can count on my one of my hands the, the, any jobs that I did get paid for back then. Right. And when I did, I put them back into my own films fair enough even back then that's but good that's good even back then yeah, yeah no, I, I... more so then but how i ended up working in the cinema was um i saw a job advertised in the job center for this uh cinema in bonwood and i didn't know they had a cinema mm -hmm. and so i i went for a job interview with uh with one of the managers called uh, dan salter and he you know i more or less got the job there and then right Nice. So yes, yeah, so I I have to say so when I was working there, I I didn't do much shorts or anything. I wasn't working so much because at that point I had made my own I'd my, made my own first short film, and also because I had in our part time job, mm -hmm. I couldn't give so much time over to to work in the industry, and also thirdly because I had made my own film. And I'd gone work. I'd gone back and worked on other people's sets, and my mindset had changed. It wasn't about helping them, this, you know, them make their film. It was more about me thinking about how I would do it and that kind of stuff. So it's one of those things when you do take a step forward, it's really hard to go back. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. No, I, I was I was fortunate as well to have some access to. Um, to the local cinema as well because uh one of my really good friends gary um he he was a projectionist in, in one of the back back when they still used to project on film um and <laughs> tarantino would have loved it um and uh yeah he he worked in a cinema so what that meant was again i was fortunate enough to obviously go behind the scenes and and see how all this stuff was was put together and and how it all worked but also as you said, get get to see screenings in advance, uh, you know, for free, and all this with staff screenings and and all of that sort of thing. So I, I did I did sort of pretty much um, live between work in the cinema, I think, <laughs> mm. you know, until I got a girlfriend, and then and then it changed a bit. <laughs> but you know, uh, yeah, it was always revolving around the cinema, obviously. <laughs> well, and. In our case, at the Cinema Bomb Wood, what they would do is the projectionist had to test the film out. And so what we what would happen is that he would invite staff up members to come and do this after hours. Yes. So it's usually the Thursday night before the film opens. That's right. And so he just, you know, he, he watched the film to see that everything was correct. There wasn't any problems. 
that everything was working before it, you know, was shown before a general audience. And so, you know, I got to see things like, um, because it was 99, it was a really good summer. So we got to see things like uh, The Matrix, Austin Powers 2, um, Star Wars, uh, The Mummy, uh, South Park, the movie. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, got to see them all before uh, the the paying public. No, that's good. Yeah, no, I was fortunate enough as well to have, similar experiences like that the other the other good thing which again is less done nowadays but the other good thing that this cinema did um was it would often get in as well older films sometimes the prints were a bit you know shitty and in bad condition and whatever but older films and have like you know late night screenings of of older classic films which um which was good because that was a way to see stuff that you know would never have been able to see before um so i remember you know things like uh oh i don't know texas chainsaw massacre and uh, don't look now and um uh alien you know the first time i saw alien on the big screen was when they had i mean i remember it was a really scratch print and obviously because a lot of the mm -hmm. nostromo was white you, you some of these scratches would really show up badly you know um but uh you, you know get to see films like that on 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 print you know on the big screen and that was great because there was some things that i'd obviously seen growing up on on television or or, or on video um but obviously it's always nice to experience it in its true aspect ratio and whatever on the big screen. So, um, I, 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 you know, those were fun times for me. That was really good when the cinema used to do all that, you know? Yeah. Well, the cinema bomb woods, um, they had, they had done a couple of events like that before I'd start working there. See, it, it had only opened that year when I started working there, but it had been open for, um, I think about six months or the beginning of the year or, or whatever. I'm not quite sure what the um, opening date was, but it wasn't that. It, it was about six months or so before I started working there. I started working there, I think it was the beginning of May, because the first film I saw there was Notting Hill. Mm -hmm. That was the first film that they were actually showing. There. Right. And they had, they had done events like that, where they had done uh, Rocky Horror. They'd showed Rocky Horror there and they had the staff all dress up as characters from the film. And the thing about the staff there was they they were all, you know, if if they weren't young, they were young at heart and they were a good bunch. We hanged out so much and we would go off clubbing and all kinds of stuff. Um the cinema was uh set up by um Julian Senior and his son David Senior. All right. Now, Julian Senior uh, works for Warner Brothers and uh, in their advertising department and, of course, is known to people as being a friend to Stanley Kubrick. Back to this Kubrick connection again. Yes. Yeah. Well, the thing was, um, I, I think I, I spoke about this in the podcast, but uh, I only saw Julian a couple of times and he, he after... Um, Kubrick's death he came down to the cinema and they threw on they did um they put on he came down to, I don't know why but he came down to watch the trailer of Clockwork Orange um at one of the screens because there was four screens and um they're all about the same size and um I don't know how it happened but I was able to to be in the screen when they did this and he was all excited he goes do you know what this is do you know what this is and they they played it, and I instantly recognised the trailer because I had gone out to the states uh, months before I saw it, and I bought a copy back with me of Clockwork Orange. And of course, they had the trailer at the beginning because it was exactly the same trailer. Right. And so he was a bit dis he was a bit deflated when I said, "Yeah, it's Clockwork Orange." Ah. I suspected that Warner Brothers were going to put Clockwork Orange out once Kubrick was dead, and. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I, I was, I was proven correct. Yeah, you weren't wrong. No, wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's it's, it's funny. Um, yeah, certainly some. I remember they had some Kubrick films as well. Um, that that that, that they got hold of prints of that, that you know got to see and whatever. I mean, again, it sounds like nothing now because obviously BFI and Prince Charles and whatever do this sort of thing all the time. Um, 
here in London. But, you, you know, down in Bournemouth, that was that was kind of, you know, and back then, you know, that when, when I was you know, still a teenager and whatever, that was that was quite a thing. So, uh, in fact, I, I still remember that this really sticks in my mind because, you know, how we say, um, you, you know, good old George Lucas has been forever sort of tinkering the Star Wars movies. <laughs> I remember Star Wars was on, obviously one of those um, films that uh, growing up I had taped off of the television when it was shown on the television. I cut the adverts out and whatever, but had New Hope uh, and watched it over and over and over just ridiculously. Um, but uh, they had a print come in of it one one time and it was like, oh, you know, got to see it on the big screen and, you know, 235 and all this sort of thing. And um, went and saw it. But it, I, me- I remember it really it really struck and really bothered me because I kind of knew the film sort of word for word by that moment. And, um, you, you know, this was again, it was a, obviously a print that he'd, he'd previously made a because he did some sound editing and some sound changing and whatever. And there's a bit where. Um, when, when when they've got on board the Death Star and they've yeah. they've they've managed to get into the control room, and um, you, you know Ben says you know about uh, plug in he should be R two should be able to interpret the entire uh, Imperial network, and then three PO says, um, oh uh, we found the controls to the power beam that's holding the ship here. Uh, we'll try to make the precise location up here on the monitor. Right. And then mm-hmm. on the version I had from the TV, 3PO then goes to sort of explain, you know, the, 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 the ship is held in the reactor at seven locations. A power loss and one of the terminals will allow the ship to leave and all this. And then Ben goes, uh, you know, I must go alone and, uh, you know, and all yeah. that stuff. I won't yeah. do the whole script. But anyway, but 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 the bit where they show the monitor is missing the bit where 3PO then makes the description. So basically he says he'll make the precise location here on the monitor. They show the monitor and then Ben goes, uh, this is too dangerous. I must go alone or whatever. And I just sort of thought to myself, wow, that really sort of stuck with me that that, you know, he'd, he'd always been, you know, people say about him tinkering with the films later, but he was always tinkering with them. You know, even if it was little things like, um, sound design and sound changes and all that sort of thing there were different versions out there so i, I always thought that was quite interesting uh just putting my projectors head on because i i did find eventually work my way up to a projectionist there um are you sure it's not that that part of the film was cut no, no 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 the film was there it was it, but I, I read about this subsequently i've gone oh, back right. and looked into this and and basically oh, okay. when he did the whole because we all know, and I don't want to bore people who are listening to this to yeah, death, but yeah, we know yeah. about it. You know, it wasn't originally episode four, A New Hope, you know, and all this oh, sort right. of thing. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. um, there, there were various changes made, and one of them on that particular reel was more description about how, how um, you, you know, the, the Millennium Falcon could escape from the tractor beam and all this sort of thing. So th- this was a slightly different version. And it, yeah, it wasn't anything to do with the magnetic strip being bad or or that piece of film being edited out or anything like that it's, it's well i was just there. thinking because i i've especially with older films that they get damaged oh yeah what we would do is just or that that the that particular print may have had a um you know it, it there might have been a screening where it got damaged and they had to cut that yeah out. no 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 this was this was actually it was all it was all there it was just as i said right. void of that that piece of dialogue and um as i said i've only i've only found in later years through through research and there are actually lots more changes that have been made to star wars over the years than people think people always think that the special editions that they did in in you know 97 or whenever it was um was the first time he changed anything that's actually not true he'd been changing stuff for years in its different releases and re-releases but they were much more subtle (laughs) than what he's done since and what we wish he hadn't done in some cases but yeah that's that's a whole other podcast yeah Yeah. (laughs) or his turn into another podcast (laughs) but um yeah um why eventually i left the uh the cinema wasn't my own choice i was actually very happy working there i have to say i did um I did find working there a, a lot of fun. I I like the people there and I like the environment and you know being around film and you know I actually you know became a projectionist and I was there f- as a projectionist for over a month. Right. And uh I could have you know 
but what happened was that they um well i was made redundant so we were all were uh, they sort of i don't know what it was they were losing money or but uh yeah they sort of try to think what the word is because we done because redundancy is coming to my mind but I receivership they went into receivership they went into receivership okay yeah yeah. That's a shame. It was, so they were independent, uh, then they weren't. They weren't part yes. of a, a no corporate no. conglomerate or anything. No. Mm. Well, it was uh, they. They they set the cinema up because they thought it strange that you know, Bournemouth and Elstree, being a film town, having the studios there, didn't have a cinema. Yeah, it does seem like a no brainer, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, and they when they first opened, they did really well. The problem was they weren't the only company in that building. Right. What happened was they had a bowling alley, you know, turn up next to Right. Them, and then suddenly a lot of their custom was going across the way. Right. Now, we had a good working relationship with them, and we what we would do is that uh, we would let their staff come in and watch films for free, and they would let our staff go over and bowl for free. And... You know, it was great. You could go bowling and, you know, they had a bar there and it was, a lot of us went drinking there and stuff. Um, and so when they were going to re- receive a ship, um, the bowling alley was in talks of taking over the cinema because they felt if that um, if the cinema closed down and there was this empty space next to them that they, they thought people would uh, turn away from them. They would think that they weren't open. And um, I remember the negotiations for that was not very good because they well for one thing they wanted us the the projection team to have less money and they were asking us if if we could do the job and or if anybody else could do the job they thought it was a case of somebody just ran up there and pressed the button <laughs> which it, which it yeah. is nowadays but never nowadays yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't realize how much went into yeah. it and you know, also the, um, for projectionists, I know I wasn't getting paid much. When I got promoted, I didn't get pay rise. I was literally still making the same amount of money, but I was in a better position. So did you start as an usher or something or box office? Yeah, or... I started as, yeah, yeah we'd start off as an usher. And right. We'd all, I, we would rotate from usher to the um, confection stands and the box office. Right. Yeah. It was, um, I remember I was working, uh, near the end I was working in the box office and I think I actually let a few people in for free. Some of our regular customers I let in for free. I gave them comp tickets. Right. Because by that point we knew the end was near and, you know, you know, we got a little fed up. Uh, but um, I think the cinema closed down for a couple of weeks and then it reopened as something else. or. Oh. I'm not quite sure because I never because I didn't live in that area. I didn't live in Bournemouth. I lived in Kingsbury at the time, so I would travel there. Right. I stopped when I first started working there. I had my car, so I was, you know, thirty minutes by car. And then uh, once I got rid of my car, I'd get the bus, and so it was usually you know over an hour to get there. Yeah, it is a shame because um, mm. you, you know, uh, great as as home cinema etc. It, it is has become and 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 has evolved and and obviously we owe a lot of um you know our childhood and our passion for this down to uh mm. home cinema but there is still and i i you know i still even think it to this day there's something to be said for watching a film in the theater on a big screen you know with big sound and in that environment i mean sa- sadly it's it's a, it's become a double edged sword nowadays because there you know you get so many people on their phones and kicking their chairs and you know just being disrespectful that it's kind of lost a little bit again now. But um, well, I, I always, think it depends on the cinema. Does, yeah. I think it depends on the cinema you go to. I mean, I used to go to Staples Corner and that was always rough. Yeah. When that first started off as a Virgin Cinema and then you know worked its way to being a, a, a Cine World. Um, it was. It's the same building. It's just exactly the same carpets as when they first opened, 
and the clientele in there could be kind of rough. Yeah. But then saying that, um, I think that my majority of cinema going experience has been good. I'm, yes, you do get the odd person who, you know, if they're not kicking the chair, they're sticking their, their knees into the back of the chair. Yeah. Or you get the, I have to say, I, I've not experienced that many people on their phones. I mean, there's been the odd time where, you know, somebody's phone's gone off, but I've, I've never really had anybody who's just been on their phone constantly. No, no. And I think most people don't stand for it. No, they? absolutely. I mean, I, I enjoy, um, you, you know, print, for, for, for even though it is a bit more rough and tumble, but, you know, the Prince Charles always has a, uh, you, you know, quite a, quite a good atmosphere in there, you know, because it is, that is kind of, uh, film enthusiasts or, or people who are into a particular cult film or whatever tend to go and see what they have there. Obviously, the BFI is always good for seeing stuff. The conduct and everything there is is really good. That, that's always a nice venue, and I quite enjoy um, quite enjoy going to see things at the IMAX theatre because uh, you know, regardless of the screen size, um, you know, even something projected normal on there looks looks pretty big and pretty decent but the sound system in that place is incredible and the seating mm. rake is really good so you you know you always yeah. get a good um good angle of vision and whatever for, for for what you're seeing so uh but yeah I, you know I, I always love to see stuff on the big screen you know uh, first and foremost and uh you know rediscover them and re-watch them on on the biggest possible screen at home or whatever later <laughs> Well, I mean, I go to um, the Peckham Plex, me and my girlfriend, and you know, it's it's a rougher cinema. It's 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 been there for a long time, and it hasn't changed much. But then the it, the price there is kind of cheap, and I have to say, I've never really had any problems there. If if, if you thought if there was a place that things would kick off, and it would be there, but, mm -hmm. you know, in the middle of Peckham, but never had a problem. Mm, cool. Yeah, no, time will tell. Yeah, but... yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's nice though, and um, yeah, you know, it, it, it was, you know, the 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 days, uh, you know, getting these screen various screenings at the cinema were always um were always memorable, but also equally, you know, working in a video library, sorry, in a video store was was kind of fun, um, because you you, you know, you'd, you'd get to see what was coming out, and we we've talked a lot about the influence of posters haven't we mm. in various podcasts oh, well the influence of vhs covers yes yeah. yeah i mean there's there's actually a book that came out uh last year of, of vhs covers and it's a is a is a beautiful you know coffee table book all oh, right okay i'll have yeah, to check that okay. sounds quite good yes yeah, it's, no it's, it's very good there's no this is the thing. It's not one of those books where it talks about it. It's just literally the video covers. Right. And they've got the... It, it's good how they do it because the page you're looking at will be... Uh, the one page facing up will be the uh, be the front cover. Yeah. And the page facing down would be... Oh, right, cover, yes. And then you have the next one. Yeah. Uh, you know, like you would have with a VHS. Yes. May I yeah. ask, do you own any VHSs? Uh, I have some down in... It, it, my parents in storage um basically when i when i moved to london i said this is quite funny actually i sold i had a ridiculously huge video collection i mean it was it was you know about 500 vhs tapes some of them box sets of things some of them you know widescreen editions you know all all in sort of pristine all watched but all in pretty good condition um and when i moved to london uh one of the things I had to do when I was starting to sort of explore the acting thing was uh, to join Spotlight, um, which is, you know, oh, okay. and, uh, yeah. you know, I had no money. I was pretty broke as well, as I've always been, you know, and um, <laughs> uh, what I ended up doing is I sold my entire video collection to uh, there was a there was an advert in Empire, the magazine Empire, um, which they would basically if you all you had to do was box them up and they'd come and collect them and sort of give you a check there and then and take them. And they, they, they got put out to some third world country, right? But the amount I made on the, the 500, um, you know, or so VHS titles that I got rid of or, or sold to that 
just about was enough money to pay for my spotlight subscription which was about 150 quid <laughs> so oh, wow. a, but having said that I, there were a few things that were special edition box sets or really rare or held sentimental value of some kind that I held on to so um, I've got the first thing I ever owned on VHS was uh, as a sell-through um, title was uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and this was a it was a previously viewed uh, rental that they they sell they sold off. Oh, right. But I had that, and and it was a bit tatty. You know, the cover wasn't pristine, mm. which always annoyed me slightly. Uh, and it had a <laughs> it had a really early teaser trailer for. Um, temple of doom uh on the front oh okay and uh just 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 for sheer you know even though i own it on blu-ray and and i've had it on dvd since and all this i I kept that for pure sentimental value um i also had a widescreen star trek i know we mentioned star trek before uh Mm. one through six box set which uh the the spines of it made up a picture of the enterprise uh oh yeah yeah oh, which one, which yeah. again it's, it was kind of nice it was numbered and everything so i kept hold of that um i think i kept hold of my back to the future trilogy box set as well because that was a special one um so i kept hold of a few but yes i do have some but no doubt no doubt if i put a tape in a machine and hit play it would probably just disintegrate (laughs) you know (laughs) but there are a few that i kept hold of but not many yeah like you i sold my collection i had quite a big collection i sold it through loop oh okay i just put an advert out and uh somebody came along and picked them all up and uh drove them away and gave me some cash did you feel sad um well no because i started collecting tv i did it soon replaced it all right with dvd yeah, yeah. so not really but um i'm just looking at my shelf now and i have two vhs tapes oh okay which ones are they i have bad taste oh wow okay yeah the early peter jackson stuff yeah <laughs> yeah which um funny enough is uh it's not on blu-ray ah. i don't know if they ever came out on dvd right i don't know well i don't think it did in this country okay and then I've got uh, a cinema club edition of uh, To Live and Die in L.A. Wow. OK. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, of all the ones. <laughs> that, yeah. OK. It's, it's yeah. not. Well, oddly, I mean, you know, there are things that still haven't been released uh, on DVD that were on VHS. I mean, I don't think there's much, but there, there's certainly some stuff you can't get hold of. Um, That's right. And you, you know, obviously, not everything that's available on DVD is 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 available on Blu-ray. I mean, it's it's getting there, but it's 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 a slow migration. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, it, well, like, like I said, it is a minefield. You know, uh, if you if you want to have <laughs> the best versions and everything, but uh, yeah, that's the way it is. But yes, I have got that, and I've probably got other titles that I haven't mentioned, but they're the ones that sprang to mind. I know I got rid of all my Bond collection, which which that hurt a little because I got them when they came out in the. Uh, they all had sort of matching spines. Um, yes, and uh, yeah. you know, but again, you know, I look at these. They, you know, half of my VHSs they were they were pan and scan editions mono soundtrack with no extras and you know took up a lot of room and and collected (laughs) a lot of dust so it's probably just as well (laughs) keith back in those days we didn't know what extras were this is true this is true oh god this is making us sound old again for god's sake (laughs) uh yeah (laughs) but no there was something to be said about it so they were good That's it. Cool. Well, that's a good place to leave it. It is. So, Keith, where can we find your work? Right. Well, if you can find my work, none of it's available on VHS. Um, <laughs> but if you go to YouTube, uh, you know, let's enter the 21st century. Go to the YouTube and uh, put in British Isles, E-Y-L-E-S, as in my surname. Uh, then you'll find um, short films that I've made there. And you can find my work at uh, independentrunnings.com you can listen to us on itunes stitcher youtube 
Um, also, you can follow us on um, on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, just search Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. And uh, wherever you listen to us, please leave us a review and a rating.